You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Today on the Useless Information Podcast, my wife Mary Jane will be joining me to discuss the classic 1950 movie Sunset Boulevard. It was nominated for 11 Academy Awards, including all four acting categories, Best Picture, Billy Wilder for Best Director, and it won three of the awards. That was Best Story and Screenplay, Best Art and Set Direction, Black and White, and Best Scoring of a Dramatic or Comedy Picture. Now, we both have very different opinions on this movie, so join us as we discuss what we liked and disliked about Sunset Boulevard. This is the Useless Information Podcast, and I am Steve Silverman. Useless information. Hi, everyone. Welcome, my wife, Mary Jane, back to the show. Hi, everyone. And uh, we're recording this on January 1st of 2022, so Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Okay, and we are talking about the movie uh, Sunset Boulevard, uh, which I mentioned came out in 1950 and was directed by Billy Wilder. Uh, It's a black and white movie. Uh, Some people would characterize it as film noir or a black comedy, and it runs an hour and 50 minutes long. The movie has four main characters. There's William Holden, who plays Joe Gillis, who's a struggling screenwriter. Gloria Swanson plays Norma Desmond, who's an actress of the silent movie era. There's Eric von Stroheim, who plays Max von Meierling, who's Norma's butler. And Nancy Olsen plays Betty Schaefer, who's Joe Gillis' love interest. Now, there are some other minor parts in the movie. They are played by Jack Webb, who plays Artie Green. And you may recognize the name Jack Webb because he played on Dragnet. And then as themselves are some famous people. There's Cecil B. DeMille, Hedda Hopper, Buster Keaton, Anna Q. Nilsson, uh, and H.P. Warner. The last three play the Waxworks, uh, which is referred to in the movie. Basically, they're like... Uh, like they belong in a wax museum. Exactly. They're so old, basically. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, a little summary of this movie is that Joe Gillis is a down-on-his-luck screenwriter, and he's trying to outrun his creditors. And as he's racing down Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, he blows a tire and pulls into the driveway of Norma Desmond, who's a silent movie queen whose film career is long over, but she dreams of making a big comeback. So Mary Jane, I know you've seen this movie before. I had never seen it before. So why don't you tell when you had seen it? Sure. I saw this movie many, many years ago, actually in a film class in Paris at, at a, you know, at the Sorbonne. And uh, what was what was the class about? That, that was... it was mostly emphasizing film noir films. Oh, so this movie so fit it's in perfectly. Ab- it's absolutely a film noir film. Okay. It's got a twist to it, but definitely it's film noir. Right. Um, it, it just doesn't seem uh, like the typical film noir movies that I've seen you know, it, over the years. It doesn't because I mean we're we're going to talk about Norma um, Desmond. Desmond, who is considered I would call her the femme fatale, which is supposed to be a woman who's kind of alluring and mysterious. And in fact, she's none of those things. The only thing she is, is she's dangerous, right. which they always are. <laughs> yeah, she definitely. Is. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you know fairly on that there's something a bit off about Norma Desmond. There's no doubt about it. Because not only is her mansion falling into a you know complete state of disrepair, you know that as soon as he pulls his car into the driveway. right. right. But her butler, Max, he answers the door. And one of the first things he says to Joe Gillis, who mistakes him, you know, for an undertaker, is, you know, if you need any help with a coffin, call me. Now, clearly, this guy knows nothing about a coffin. And you quickly find out that they're referring to the burial of Norma Desmond's chimpanzee. And I'd say from that point on, the movie just kind of spirals more and more and more into craziness. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very dark and weird for sure. Yeah. So now, there, in reality, the movie has two main characters. There's Norma Desmond and Joe Gillis. So let's start with Norma Desmond, who's played by Gloria Swanson. And I, I know, Mary Jane, you have a lot to say about both Norma Desmond and Gloria Swanson. But let's start with the character herself. Um, how would you describe Norma Desmond? Well, right from the very beginning, you see that she has hundreds of photos of herself in her mansion. Yeah. And when you say hundreds of photos, you're not just talking about they're spread out all over the place. You're you're talking about, you know, imagine a piano or yeah. or or a mantle in a fireplace and there'd be dozens of pictures of her in frames, uh, you know, on those things. Right. I mean, it they're it's cluttered all over her mm-hmm. mansion. So that that's obvious. We know she wants to make this comeback. 
And in the movie, they make it seem like it is virtually impossible because of her age. Mm-hmm. And it really, it is, a, it is a form of ageism when you watch this movie. Uh, I know when we watched it, you and I both wondered, how old is she? I thought, oh, maybe mid-40s. And of course, as it turns out, she's 50, exactly 50 while she's, mm-hmm. she's making this film. But they make her appear more with her acting than her actual appearance, that, but that she is incredibly old and almost monster-like. And, mm-hmm. and to some extent, they, the makeup and the way they have her hair, she kind of looks like uh, Frankenstein's bride, right? right. Yep. So there's just there's a lot of uh, subtext there that's very interesting, I think. Yeah, this is a movie that you could analyze from here to the end of your life and just keep discovering new things. You know, some movies you just watch them and that's it. Uh, I've now seen this movie three times and every time I watch it, I see things that I didn't see, you know, the time before. Right, because in a way it, it, it's a bit of a mashup between a horror flick and, and a film noir and that, that makes it very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, talk about daring. I mean, that's just unusual. Now, you mentioned this to me right after the movie was over that you fell from even the very beginning, right? When he pulls into the mansion it was kind of like her casting her spider's web. Yes, because she says something like, hey, you, and she's looking through the blinds. She's mm-hmm. wearing black uh, circular uh, sunglasses that make her look spider-like, which mm-hmm. is very strange. You know, how many people wear sunglasses indoors? So they definitely were working with that whole look of her being a black widow spider. She's mm-hmm. dangerous. Yeah, and and of course, uh, the second character we'll talk about, you know, this guy Joe, I mean, she really pulls him in and he he sinks deeper and deeper and deeper into this trap she has, uh, you know, cast. Right, It's it's very gradual. He really thinks at first he's getting the best uh, from her in a way, at least financially, but in fact, he's very wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, her character kind of reminded me of Dracula. You know, she gets your teeth into you and then you would then become, uh, you know, pulled into that whole thing. Uh, of course, uh, he didn't become a vampire, but... Right, I, but I mean, the way they make her clench her fingers, they they, they look claw-like. This, it's, mm-hmm. it's just... It's, you know, in some ways it's funny, some ways it's just strange. It's mm-hmm. Now, th- one of the big disagreements we have is on the acting, Gloria Swanson's acting here. So why right. don't you tell me what you think of her acting and then I'll comment on what I thought. Well, I thought she had a really tough role to play for one thing. I mean, she she had to take it seriously, the fact that she is playing an actress who wants to make a comeback who's very authoritative, you know, I think she does a great job with that, but she also has to be peculiar. She has to be strange with her eyebrows, with her, as I said, like with the way she moves her fingers and makes them claw, like, I think she pulls it off and it's a tough thing to do. So I thought she did a great job. Yeah. So, uh, of course I'm watching this movie for the first time and I have to admit, I knew nothing about the movie. Absolutely nothing. I, I, in fact, there were only three little bits of it uh, that I knew of. One is at the beginning, it opens with him floating in a pool. Right. And I don't really want to go into exactly what's going on there. And then, of course, is that famous scene at the end where she comes down, uh, you know, the staircase. And, right. Everybody seems to know that that right. scene. <laughs> yeah. So, I, but it's just little tidbits that I knew, uh, you know, just, I guess, because they're so ingrained in our culture right. that I knew them. Right. But I knew nothing about the movie. And I have to tell you, for the first, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, I'm just cringing at her acting. I'm just like, this is so over the top. I can't believe people love this movie. It, it was, it seemed that bad to me. Right. But, now, but you learn later on, of right. course, that she's very, that she's has mental issues. <laughs> right. Um, now, of course, then I watched it two additional times since then. We actually watched the movie with the intention of recording this, and then we couldn't. Right. And then I had to go back later on. Had to on. delay it a bit. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I had to go back and rewatch the movie. And uh, now knowing how the story goes, it all makes sense. But I have to tell you, the first time through, it was pretty painful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, of course, Gloria Swanson was a superstar in her day in silent yeah, movies. Sure. But when she fell out of favor, she just kind of walked away from Hollywood. And there's a scene, you know, in the movie where she pulls up. She's actually being chauffeured by her butler. Right. But they pull up to the gates of Paramount Studios, and she states, and I'll just play this little clip here. Yeah. 
and teach your friend some manners. Tell him without me, he wouldn't have any job, because without me, there wouldn't be any Paramount Studio. You're right, Miss Desmond. Now, that statement is partially true, uh, and that's because she was one of the most bankable stars of the silent era, and she made uh, the company, which was known as Famous Players Lasky Corporation, which would evolve into Paramount, she made them an incredible amount of money. In fact, she was their top star six years in a row. Now, my question for you, and I always have a question of the day. Right. You ready? Yes, I am. And don't answer it right now. I, I you, won't. you got to leave it for I'll, the end of the podcast. I'll, I'll reflect on it. How many movies did she make for Paramount? Okay, and of course, this is one of them. But how many movies in total did she make for Paramount? And I'll let you think about that for a bit. But try and get a number in the back of your head as to how many movies she may have made. Try to come up with an estimate. Okay. Okay. So while you're pondering over the answer to that question, let's move on to the next character. That's Joe Gillis, the screenwriter who's played by William Holden. And as a struggling screenwriter, he smells opportunity when Norma offers to pay him to write her screenplay Salome. And honestly, through the whole movie, I just kept hearing salami, salami. Um, Anyway, um, and ultimately, and this is what they refer to, a lot of people call him a gigolo. Yeah. But as you pointed out to me, there's a better term, and that would be... Yes, I really feel his character slowly becomes a kept man. He's almost um, kept as a... Well, financially, he's very dependent on her, but he's also almost like a prisoner in that mansion. Mm -hmm. And he's very dependent on her. And in fact, he's supposed to be writing a script for her, but you never see an exchange of money. She buys things for him, but she doesn't actually pay him. Right. And um, he's very frustrated by this. And Gigolo kind of suggests, which the critics used, you know, that term, that suggests he has some control in this situation and he has none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That's part of his frustration. Uh, yeah, all, the, all I can think of, this is a guy who sold his soul to the devil. Right, right. And in the end, you know, when we do get kind of a little further into the story, you you can you see that he's he's very ashamed of his circumstances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Oh, of course, we don't want to give away the movie, but no, uh, not too um, much. <laughs> although uh, I would bet a lot of people have seen this movie. It, it's a very uh, maybe not among younger people. I think most older right. people have seen it. I think I may have been one of the few exceptions that hadn't. So clearly from the minute this movie opens, you know exactly what his fate is going to be. And we're not giving away anything here because you know it from the second the movie starts. And right, it, it begins with his murdered body face down in a swimming pool. Right, which is one of the few things I had ever known about the movie. It's just a very famous scene. And of course, he's now deceased and he's, he, he goes back in time and describes how he ends up floating right, in this pool. Right, he's narrating his whole journey. Yes. Right. What did you think about the narration? Did, did it was it annoying, or or did you think it was well done? What did you think? Yeah, I, I you know I read that certain critics did not like it. I personally like that. I like the fact that you are able to know that person's inner thoughts, and you know better than just to see it being acted out. So I thought it was very efficient and good. I, I like I like narration like that. Yeah, I actually like the narration also. I have to say, uh, and I've mentioned this before uh, to you in, in just our discussions, is that right after that scene, they kind of go back in time, and he's in the, uh, the the studio head's office. Right. I thought the acting was awful. I mean, it just seemed very, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe rigid and, and phony to me. Um, but the narration itself, I thought, was excellent throughout the entire movie. In fact, a lot of the scenes that took place out of – outside of Norma's home, I just didn't think flowed very well. Um, whereas whenever they were in Norma's home, I think everything went much better. Well, I mean, the leads were very good, I, right. I think. So mm-hmm. that's that's a big part of it. Sure. Right. I will say, I thought it was very, very well written. Um, you know, I, I thought the dialogue, even what he's just reading, or even the dialogue between the characters, very sharp point, yeah. uh, you know, right, right on the money. Right, right. And it's aged well, too. Right. Uh, I wouldn't say the movie itself has aged well. And this is one of the right. things we, we, we disagree scenes. about. But I did think that it was one of the best written scripts I've ever heard. Um, and, and I guess we should mention it's kind of a criticism on Hollywood. Uh, you know, basically how they chew you up and you know spit you out. Once they're done with you, they make you a big star. And then when you're no longer selling tickets or you're too old or whatever, they just spit you out and move on to the next big thing. Now, in that area, I do have to disagree a bit. Now, mm-hmm. You know, as you know, I was kind of saying I felt the 
the subtext is just she's too old. She should know that, and she's crazy. She she can't understand that she doesn't belong in the movies, because when she does go to the cin- the excuse me the studio, everyone is very kind to her, and they're very happy to see her, including the director. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it's such a criticism on Hollywood. I think it's more on just the fact that she's aged out of the system. That's I agree with you on yeah. that. That that is part of the movie. But I do think, uh, especially with the scene with the waxworks, where these former silent stars are playing cards with her, that's basically the, what I thought was the key to the movie. Is that when they switch from silent to you know talkies, all of a sudden there's no place for these stars anymore. Not only have they aged out, but maybe they had accents or the way you act in a silent movie is very different from how you would act. Uh, you know, in a talkie. And uh, I think, you know, basically Hollywood just did a, did away with all these people. And that's why they were all brought in to kind of sit around the table to make that point. Uh, well, I suppose. I, I think actually where you actually see Hollywood being cruel is with the script writer. I mean, they won't even lend him $300. And I know that's worth more today, but, but they really, he's, you know, he had a good script or two and now they don't really want to talk to him anymore. Right. It's a, it's something I've told you before with other celebrities, modern celebrities, you know, that the press makes you and they break you. And I kind of, you kind of get that impression from the movie also, you know, they build some of these people up into the greatest stars and they're super geniuses. But as soon as they do one thing that's bizarre or odd or... Or they age out of the system. Or they age which out. Which is really the They no longer situation. want them anymore, yeah. you know. Yeah. So anyway, I wouldn't say we have a disagreement on that, but I, I think the, the underlying message that we got from the movie is different. Right. Absolutely. Now, the next character I want to talk about is Eric Von Stroheim, who played Max. And uh, Von Stroheim was an incredibly successful uh, director in the 1920s, of course, for silent movies. And one of his lines in the movie was, and let me just play that. There were three young directors who showed promise in those days. D.W. Griffith, Cesar B. DeMille, and Max von Meyerling. Many have argued that this line was referenced to von Stroheim himself because he was one of the right. biggest directors. It's of also his day. name is very similar to his character's name right. in the film. Yeah, von Meierling von Stroheim. Now, there is a scene in the movie, and I'm sure you remember this. They're sitting in her living room, which is this giant, giant room. Right. Now, yeah. today, everybody would, have the, everybody would have the big screen TV. In those days, she had a, her own movie projector projecting up onto a screen on the wall. And they're watching a movie and she's watching herself in her younger days. And it really is. Gloria Swanson. Yeah, Yeah, in her younger days in a movie that was directed by Von Stroheim. You don't know that when you're watching the movie. But when you find that afterwards, it's kind of a neat little thing they threw in there. It's kind of a tribute to uh, how popular and how successful she was. Sure. And how important he was also. Right. Now, what did you think about his character? Well, it's important. He's he's very creepy, yeah, <laughs> and he's and he's very protective of her. And and at first, you're not aware of why he puts up with her because he's very demeaning towards her. He he she's not very respectful of him. Um, but it's great. I think he does a good job because he doesn't say much. He doesn't have many lines, and no. yet he's very important to the the movie and, and the ambience of the movie, which yeah, is he, very. He's creepy. clearly a supporting actor, but yes. I have mm-hmm. to. I, I really thought he was like the glue that brought it all together. I mean, the main story between the two main characters is really important, but him being there from the moment he opens that door and, you know, uh, you know, and and lets him in uh, just everything about him just brought it, you know, as you said, it's kind of, he's kind of creepy. Yeah. And he's everywhere. I mean, whenever you look around, Oh, there he is. I I didn't know he was in the room and there he is. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, but his devotion to her, you you don't find out until the very end and we don't want to give away that little bit, but there is a reason why he's so devoted to her, even though she lives in this fantasy world where she, she yeah. thinks she's still super popular and she's going to have a comeback. Yeah. And despite the way she treats him, because she does not treat him well. <laughs> yeah, she's cruel to him, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he continues to put up with it. And there is a reason that's revealed near the end. But again, we don't want to give that away. Okay. And of course, then there's the car. <laughs> yes. I mean, they couldn't have chosen a more appropriate vehicle, this kind of over-the-top, uh, antiquated vehicle. The car, I believe, is pronounced Isota Franchini. 
Uh, and it was, I believe, an Italian vehicle. I'm not sure on this. Yes, uh, it sounds Italian. Yeah. Right? And uh, there weren't many made, but big stars in the silent days purchased these cars. And I believe they were the most expensive vehicle available right. in its day. But, but to look at it today, it, it almost looks like a hearse. It, yeah. it, it's perfect for the movie, but it's, it's not a very attractive car. Yeah, I think it was chosen on purpose, again, for the right. creepiness. Uh, yeah. uh, I should point out, uh, I don't know if you came across this as you were doing your reading, but Von Stroheim couldn't drive. Oh, so, I didn't know that. So when you see him driving, basically he's either, you know, you know, they're the, not really moving. Well, not that they're not moving. The car <laughs> is on the back of, you know, maybe another vehicle that's moving and he's pretending to drive oh, while they okay. film it, which is so, common in Hollywood. Yeah. You know? With the background uh, going, uh, flying by. Yeah. And, and I don't know if this is really true. And some people said maybe it's not, but apparently when they're at the gates of Paramount studios and he's trying to drive in through the gates and they stop him and he starts to move, they're actually pulling with ropes. They're pulling the car with ropes oh, through the gate. Oh, wow, sure. And, and this is the part I'm not really sure is true, and I have a feeling it's exaggerated. <laughs> Apparently, he still crashed. No, <laughs> yeah. like he really didn't know how to drive. Right. Oh, my um, goodness. Which actually, uh, if you think about it, wasn't surprising. I mean, here you are, uh, you know, a guy who reached adulthood in the days when people had horse and buggies. Not you everybody know? had a car. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, pretty common back then, I think, for a lot of people not to learn to drive. And I guess the last character we'll talk about is Nancy Olsen, who was Joe Gillis's love interest in the movie. Right. Uh, basically, uh, she goes into the name uh, Betty Schaefer. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you think about her? I, li- I liked her. Her character I liked very much. I thought it was interesting, of course, to the storyline because she's the polar opposite of um, Gloria Swanson's character, mm-hmm. right? I mean, for one thing, she's youthful. They mention her age. He even asks her her age. Which is? 22. Right, which, right? and I believe she was just shy of 22 yeah. when that was being filmed. Yeah, and um, she's also very driven and she's ambitious, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and but, but she's supposed to be, again, that opposite of um, Gloria Swanson in that she says she doesn't want to be in front of the camera. She wants to write. She wants to be behind the camera. Right. And uh, so she, to me, she's kind of the modern, the modern woman. Right? Oh, I agree. And, uh, of course, this is 1950 where a lot of women, you know, I, I guess when they were young, they went to work. Uh, but I'm even thinking of my own mom. I mean, you know, she right, worked they, until she had children. Right. They didn't all work outside the home very much. Right. Right. Um, now, uh, what did you think about her acting? Now, see, I, I liked her acting. I think she, um, you know, she was kind of showing this young enthusiasm. So I, I thought she did a good job with it. I know. Yeah. Uh, and I did briefly mention to you at the end of the movie that yeah. at the beginning of the movie, mm-hmm. I thought she was screaming to the microphone. It just seemed very... I wouldn't say bad acting. It was almost like the microphone couldn't pick up her voice. Maybe she was too soft-spoken and she had to almost yell her lines. It wasn't quite like that, but that's the impression I got. And all I can think is what we're experiencing with this podcast yeah, right sometimes now. sometimes we have issues with the microphone. Yeah, I mean, basically your voice is not picked up well by the microphones. I'll just describe right now. Your your mouth is like one inch from the microphone. If you move even the slightest bit it from the microphone, catch. it won't you know, get what I have Basically, to say. it drops your voice. Oh. So um, that's kind of what I thought was going on there. But I have to say, within a few minutes uh, into the movie, I just kind of forgot about that. But that initial time hearing her talk, I just like, holy cow! You know, she's screaming at the microphone. Yeah, um, I don't know. I interpret it as like she's so enthusiastic. She really wanted to write mm-hmm. a, a, a script with him. Uh, right. you know, that's part of the storyline, of course. But yeah, um, I, I, I will say, you know, by the second viewing of this movie, I, I really liked her character. So no, it was just the first time that I noticed that. And then no. the second time I just kind of, I guess I grew into it, you know. And I, I mean, you didn't really ask me this, but I do think that they had a, a bit of a chemistry, which they're supposed to in this movie, that mm-hmm. her, uh, Will, um, William Holden and, and the actress, yeah. Yeah. And we should mention that Nancy Olsen is still alive. Yeah. She's 93 years old. Yeah. And uh, I actually saw an interview or uh, interview of her from probably about 2014 or so. I'm just kind of guesstimating on the okay, date there. Okay, great. A, she looked beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you'd never know uh, how old she was. Uh, she looked a lot younger than uh, uh, than her real age. Good genes. And, and, <laughs> and wow, I mean, she just, uh, uh, her voice, I mean, she's just incredible speaker. I mean, she had a lot to say. Uh, she did mention that after this movie and she saw 
how Hollywood just basically chewed you up and spit you out. She <laughs> kind of left Hollywood. I really? mean, she, she infrequently did movies and and what and maybe a few TV shows after that, but basically she separated herself from it and decided not to be part of it. Yeah, you know, the reaction to this movie um by a lot of people a lot of people were upset by it and some thought that um the criticism was harsh. That was people within Hollywood, sure. but some actresses actually were upset also by it, by seeing it, you know, so people took it seriously. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody likes the, the focus being on what they do. You know, they like, people like to pick, you know, point out the problems in other things, but not your profession. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I, and I think we, we did both were re- read that the, two of the characters said, listen, this is not really us that's being portrayed. And that was the the character of Max right. and the character of, of Norma Desmond. They both, when they were being interviewed, said, you know, this really isn't us because the movie is upsetting to some people. Right. Yeah. Okay, so now that we've discussed the four main characters, what do you think was your favorite scene in the movie? Well, my favorite scene, I guess, would be with him and Betty Schaefer, his love interest, where he pretty much explains to her why he is no no longer deserving of her her love. Mm-hmm. You know that he really doesn't deserve to to be with her. I, it's very sad. You know, the scene is very sad, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's quintessentially film noir. He he's never going to be deserving of of the life he 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 seeks to get you mm-hmm. know and that's the way it is with all of those those characters that's part of the it's almost the theme of film noir is they they never succeed it, right it's it's sad but that's the way it is although i have to say after that scene and he then starts packing up and leaving yeah. and i you know in the back of my head i'm like he's given up the girl and he's giving up the life that he has it didn't why would you choose not to have either? Why Why couldn't he have given up the life he had with Norma Desmond and then go off with his, well, his I, love, you know? <laughs> I think I think he at least wants to be fi- financially independent. So he is striking out on his own. He's doing something that is impressive, but sad at the same time. Because mm-hmm. you're right, he's he's given up the the potential for having true happiness. And my favorite scene um, was when she goes to visit Cecil B. DeMille on the set. And it just happened to be the set. They don't mention this in the movie, but it's the set of Samson and Delilah, which oddly was the most successful movie of 1950. Oh, yeah. Um, And I believe it started, I mean, I read this somewhere Mm -hmm. months ago when we were planning on doing this. I may have this wrong, but I believe Hedy Lamarr was the star. And they were talking about having her in this movie but apparently uh, Cecil B. DeMille demanded that she get like $10,000 or some crazy amount. And of course, uh, Billy Wilder refused. So that's why she's not in the movie. But I did like that scene because a, I thought Cecil B. DeMille was the most realistic actor in the entire movie. I just thought he was so real and down to earth, um, giving good advice to her, even though he, I mean, I don't want to really give too much away, right? but he's trying to, you know, not hurt her feelings, protect her. Uh, and not tell her that, you know, basically right. she's not wanted anymore in Hollywood. She doesn't have a, a future in pictures. Um, but I also just like the fact, not only his acting, but she sat down and all of a sudden these people from, oh, her, yeah, they from her past just gather her around. And, and it, it's kind of like, you know, someone who was a star 20, 30 years ago, and yet they go somewhere and people are like, oh, that's whoever. And, you know, they all come right. around. And, and they want, know who she is. Right. Yeah. And they want your autograph, even though your career is probably, you know, the, the high point of your career is long past. So I really like that scene. I just thought Cecil B. DeMille, who is not an actor. Right. Uh, just did a fantastic job. And it, uh, of anything in that entire movie, I thought it was the most realistic. Yeah, he did do a good job. Yeah. He did. So um, now uh, speaking of film sets. Did you feel like this movie was filmed on a set? Well, the mansion, yeah. <laughs> which is very, it's over the top. It's very garish and all that. So yes, it does seem a bit like a set. That didn't bother me. I mean, I just, I knew they were trying to make it almost appear like a silent movie uh, scene, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, a lot. So, but yeah, I mean, it seemed like a set. I, I, I guess uh, the one thing we didn't mention about Gloria Swanson and how, you know, I mentioned at the beginning how I thought she was overacting, but really 
you after you watch a movie the first time, you realize what she's doing is how silent movie stars were. They couldn't speak, so they so they had to exaggerate. They exaggerated. Yes. They, they they really use their faces and their, their hands, hands and, and their and body language to express what was going yeah. on in the scene. When you go back the sec after watching it through, you, you understand were, it better. Right. For sure. Exactly. Yep. Still wonderful, isn't it? And no dialogue. We didn't need dialogue. We had faces. So we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors, but when we return, we'll continue with our discussion of Sunset Boulevard. Welcome, Welcome back. back. So before we uh, get to answering the question of the day, I thought we'd uh, read portions of three movie reviews from the day when this movie came out. Okay. Okay, and we're not going to read any of them in their entirety. And I should mention they all, all three that we are going to read uh, were published on either August 18th or August 19th of 1950 when the movie came out. So we don't have to keep repeating the dates for them. Sure. Okay, so the first one I have is from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And one of the paragraphs reads, uh, The fact is Sunset Boulevard is a picture that people are going to be talking about for a long time. Its setting is Hollywood, its story is pure Hollywood, and its handling is Hollywood with all the stops out. And it continues... Holden finds he has to get away from it all every now and then. Away from the mansion, he meets and falls in love with Nancy Olsen, a girl his own age. From there, everything, including Miss Swanson, really goes to pieces. She finally goes mad while descending a giant staircase in front of a battery of newsreel cameras. And that's the world-famous scene uh, that right. ends the movie. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. In her madness, Miss Swanson, eyes flashing, believes she's making a movie comeback in the role of a great princess. It's a wonder to watch. It's also a scene to warm Hollywood's heart and keep it warm until award time. And of course, she didn't win the Academy Award for this movie. Right. Um, but she was nominated for Best Actress. But they're still talking about it today. That's right. I, that's <laughs> so, why I read that portion yeah. of it. I mean, the fact that we're still 70 talking about it. 70 years later, right? Right. Um, so why don't you read the next one? Okay. So this is from the Cincinnati Inquirer. The plot offers a new sort of daring realism, a barbed satire which does not spare Hollywood and its denizens, past and present. One wonders for a moment whether Miss Swanson's ability does not disprove the film's suggestion that an actress can have no glamour at 50. One is also inclined to ask whether William Holden is to blame for becoming entangled in her meshes. Many another young man has compromised himself in other ways for less. It's so true. Yeah. Okay. And the last one we have is from the Shimokin News Dispatch, uh, page nine, if you're curious. Sunset Boulevard would be a memorable film if only because it marks the return to the screen of Gloria Swanson. In the role of Norma Desmond, the faded movie star who refuses to believe the public has forgotten her, she is magnificent and there aren't enough superlatives to heap on William Holden for his portrayal of the screenwriter. Easily the top performance of his career, it establishes him as one of the film capital's finest actors. Well, I absolutely agree with what the critics had to say. I think it's interesting, though, to realize that they both were nominated for Best Actor for their roles, and neither of the, them got it for the Academy Awards. Yeah, um, I read somewhere that, uh, and it's a while ago again, because we, we had planned on reviewing right, this movie many sure. months ago. Uh, I read that uh, basically Gloria Swanson was going up against Betty Davis. Okay. And because they were both you know, odds-on favorites to win, they basically split the vote, and the person who was in third won, won Best Actress. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so earlier in the podcast, I had given you a question to think about. Right. And I'm sure you've been thinking about it the entire time. Oh, right? my goodness. You, you thought of nothing else of since. Of course. Okay, so I told you that Gloria Swanson for six years in a row, that would be from 1919 to 1925, was the top star at what would become Paramount Studios. And I asked you how many movies did she make during that time, and what was your answer? All right, so I'm going to tell you what I chose as my answer and my logic. I'm hoping, or I, I, I believe that possibly they made films faster. They were shorter. So in six years' time, if she's very popular, goodness, they may have contracted her for, I'm going to go big. I'm going to okay. go 15. 15. Well, maybe you should go even bigger. Really? Mm -hmm. 
In all, six years. Yeah. Goodness. She, she made 29 feature length movies, which weren't, you know, two hours back then. Sure. And she made two shorts for them. And of course, later on in her career, she made Sunset Boulevard. So that makes a total of 30 movies she made for Paramount that's, plus the two shorts. That's amazing. Surprisingly, uh, she was so popular, they offered her $1 million per year in her contract. And she decided to leave for United Artists in 1925. Did she, she did you as well? Uh, I don't believe so. I, I, I'd be lying if I said I knew exactly. Yeah, right. Uh, but mm -hmm. clearly she had another problem coming, and that was the talkies. Right. And, of course, nobody stays uh, popular forever. Um, I think it was Elton John once said, you know, even when you're the most popular person in the world, you get your five or six years, and then yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's that's the highlight of your career. So, uh, But she did pretty well. I mean, uh, movies were much shorter back then, uh, but to do 30 movies and to be the top billing star for those number of years – now, I should mention, I don't think we mentioned this earlier, is that, you know, unlike uh, Norma Desmond, Gloria Swanson, when her career dried up in Hollywood, she just left. She didn't try. She, she knew when to leave. <laughs> right, exactly. She was on top or, you know, maybe she saw her career dying off. Right. Uh, that it was time to leave. And she, I believe she moved to New York. I could be wrong on that. And, uh, you know, went into radio and then into TV and she kept her career going. This movie Sunset Boulevard in 1950 kind of gave her a resurgence. And of course everybody said she's back, but apparently the roles that she was offered, you know, after that were all right. kind of more Norma Desmond type roles oh my goodness. and she didn't want to do those. So uh, she never really had the same success after right. that. This movie was like one big, you know, successful movie, and then there were none that followed after that. And of course, there's probably film historians who are going to say that I'm wrong on that because I'm just, you know, doing this from memory. Right. But I, I do know that she was at times interviewed and she said, I am not that character. Right. So she got very annoyed with being compared to uh, the character of, of Norman Desmond. So she probably would not want to continue to play her parts, you right. know, that, that similar parts, I guess. Yeah. Nobody wants to be typecast. Right. Now this movie makes a lot of best ever made movie lists, you know, the, you know, the right. top 10, top hundred movies and so on. It's currently number 16 on the American film Institute's list of the top hundred best American films of the 20th century. And I would say if you looked on something like uh, internet movie database, almost everybody gives it a 10 out of 10. Now we're teachers of course. Right. And uh, we're going to use that zero to a hundred because that's, you know, teachers got to pull out their red pen and do that. So on a scale of zero to a hundred, how would you rate this movie? So I'm going to give it a 95. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for that 100 or 98, but, but I'm, I'm just going to give it a 95. I, but that means I loved it. I thought it was very good. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to give it two scores and there's a reason for this. Oh, okay. Uh, the first score I'm going to give it is based on my first viewing of it, knowing nothing about the movie. Okay. Um, and the fact that I really, I, I, I'm not kidding. I was checking my watch. I'm like, is this movie ever going to end? You know, because I had no idea what was going. Where it was uh, headed. And I yeah. had no, I really had no clue she was playing someone who was basically mentally ill in the movie. And I really saw a lot of bad acting. So I would say, based on my first viewing, I'd probably give it a 70 or a 75. Okay. Okay. Now, after two additional viewings and knowing where the story is going more and about it. Sure. being able to sit back and really absorb what's going on, I'm not going to go as high as you. Uh, I'd say it's a, a middle B, maybe about an 85. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my score did go up with a second and third viewing. Yeah. So uh, I guess the question comes would you recommend that people watch this movie? I would absolutely recommend it to a certain type of person, mm -hmm. like for someone who likes. Uh, the history of cinema, someone who is interested in what they call film noir, that that genre, mm -hmm. and and also gender politics. You know, people who really likes to analyze, um, you know, the subtext of a movie because that you could go on and talk for hours about. And, and I agree with that. Uh, I would say this is not a movie for people who don't like black and white movies. Right. You have to, if you can't get over that, you're you're not going to watch it. Right. And I don't. I mean, I mentioned this to you personally before. Uh, I don't think the movie as a whole has held up cinematically uh, over the years. I think the story is very good. Um, I think it's very well written. Uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, reading into all the details uh, and what's really going on, it it's incredible what well, was yeah. done in that movie. An well, analyzing the gender relations in a way, that, mm -hmm. that is, it, it's, it's very current, actually. I right. think So in that sense, it's great. Right. But I, I, I don't think the movie as a whole, in terms of the cinematography and just how it was filmed and so on, has aged 
as well as because I mean as some movies. As some yeah. movies. I mean, we saw the best years of our lives, uh, which was the first movie we reviewed, yeah. and I think in a sense that held up better than this movie does. On the other hand, we. It's a, well, I'm just going to say it's a completely different type, oh, sure. of type of movie too, because this is just, it's, it's playing with two different genres. It's, it's, yeah, it's very different. Right. But, yeah, so, sure. um, but anyway, I mean, if, as you said, if you're a film buff or you're really into analyzing movies, uh, I would definitely recommend that you see it. If you're just a casual viewer and you don't, I, I think I'm just thinking of my students, you know, high school students. I don't think a lot of them would really like this movie. They may like it when they get older. But when they're young, I don't think they would. Right. That that's very possible. I, I think even for some people who aren't sure, try to watch the first half hour and then you I feel you'd have to continue to watch it. Right. Which is important, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now if you do want to watch this movie, it is available for free on archive.org. Right. Just type in Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think if you put in parentheses nineteen fifty and select, you know, the check mark for movies, uh, it will pop up. Now I should point out it has Spanish subtitles, subtitles at the bottom. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's. Cl- I don't think it's a legal copy, but it is there until someone catches it and removes it. Right. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think uh, most of the streaming services have it, but you have to pay probably a couple of bucks or something right. to watch but, it. But I will say it didn't bother me at all. I, I just didn't pay attention to mm-hmm. them. You know? And probably your local library has it on DVD. It's, it, yeah. it is that famous of a movie. Of course, yes. Um, if they don't have that one, they probably don't have most classic movies from that time period. Right. Anyway, let's bring this to a close. Uh, I right. just want to thank everybody for uh, listening to us talk about this movie. Yep. Um, we did have a little bit of a disagreement on our views of the movie and our analysis, you know, our analysis and how we ranked it. But um, we both did enjoy the movie, I would say. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I do recommend if you're a film buff to go out there. You and, should uh, see take it for sure. It. Although Absolutely. I would say if you're a film buff, you probably saw it already. Right. Of course. Yes. Most anyway. Likely. Uh, see it I'll, again. <laughs> yeah. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with the next story, which I have been working on. Uh, I think I mentioned last podcast, I had dental surgery. Well, I had two more dental surgeries since yes, then. Yes. Uh, and I'm just getting to the point where I can talk again. And it's not that I couldn't write anything. It's just that I was in a lot of pain and it's very hard to concentrate. And the story that I'm working on is, has a lot of documentation to it. Uh, Honestly, I stopped printing it out because I was, I was well over 150 sheets of paper, uh, just different stories. And it's very repetitive, at least not the story I'm going to tell, but uh, this is a woman. She was a Hollywood actress, not a very successful one, but she was in a number of movies and during the silent uh, era. Oh, gosh. And she mm. somehow got into this other career okay. of living in what they called a glass house. And she did that for the rest of her life. Ooh. And it's kind of an mm. unusual story. <laughs> um, but what would happen is she'd live in this glass house in town after town after town. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it was kind of a publicity thing for different stores. Okay. And uh, so it gets very repetitious. And I don't want to make the story that I'm writing repetitious, but I have to read through. the Do you know, all the research. Do all the research, you know, and go through all these stories, which kind of tell almost the same thing over and over again mm-hmm. and just pull out the meat of it and then put it into some sort of cohesive story. So the fact that I was in so much pain and the fact that I had so much documentation to go through, I am probably uh, about a week, week and a half uh, away from finishing the script for it, and then I'll record it. Okay. So probably, you know, I'm shooting for mid-month to uh, get it posted. So, But it is a good story. I actually like it. I hope other people will also. Anyway, uh, we'll, we'll bring it to a close here. We're kind yeah. of blabbing on. Um, <laughs> so Mary Jane, thanks for joining me again. No problem. I enjoyed it. Yeah, and I hope everybody out there has a great new year. I hope uh, 2022 is better than what was going on in 2021. And everybody is happy. Me too, by the way. Yeah, (laughs) and I hope everybody is happy and healthy and they stay safe. Yeah. Uh, Take care, everyone. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.